All right, we're studying the book of Acts, and we're going to begin today in the sixth chapter, Acts chapter 6. We're going to read through the chapter at some point here, and um, just, to re- just by way of reminder, uh, my goal is to do 30 to 35-minute sessions here. Take a break. You can take um, an opportunity to use the restroom. Maybe get a bite to eat for a moment. I have a little discussion, a Q&A, whatever, and then we'll come back and we'll do that again, 30 to 35 minutes. Take another break, and uh, you can talk to your facilitator if there's any questions. And then we'll finish things up with another 30 to 35 minute session. And that should get us through all of the material today. So we're in Acts chapter 6, if you would like, just for a moment, go back to the table of contents, and uh, this is kind of encouraging for me, maybe it is for you. You look at page number one, we have essentially covered all of the material on page number one in our study thus far. Turn the page, we get up through the first uh, five lines there, down through about page number 85, 86, we have already gone through. So I hope you have a notebook. If you do, We want to go to page number 87 in the notebook, Acts chapter 6. And again, once again, I will do everything I can to follow the notebook so you won't get lost in the process. So Acts chapter 6, we deal with uh, a group of people that today we call these people deacons. Your uh, King James Bible does not use the word deacon. Um, but the word deacon is a transliteration from a Greek word, diakonos, which is simply, uh, uh, simply means a minister or a servant. So when we talk about deacons, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who were appointed by the leadership of the church to uh, tend to certain things, maybe what we would call more menial tasks, more service-oriented tasks, while the apostles themselves were given to the ministry of the Word of God and to prayer. We'll read that in the chapter. So this is the first officially appointed group of helpers to the apostles. There aren't a lot of titles that you'll find in your Bible. You'll find uh, the term bishop, elder, pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet, deacon, And uh, the list gets pretty short after that. And each of those uh, offices or those words have some kind of biblical description and exactly what their responsibilities were and what functions they played in the early church. So um, this group that we call the deacons, they were appointed, as we said, for ministry and service to take some of the load off the apostles as the church uh, experienced explosive growth. (coughs) If we go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verses 8 through 12, we'll see there that Paul lists for us and for Timothy, he lists the qualifications that were expected of those who were called deacons. We'll look at them in just a little bit. Remember that the main uh, goal or the main mission of the book of Acts is found in the first chapter in the eighth verse that says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses. So the book of Acts is all about teaching, training, and um, establishing those in the early church to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And then we get the record of how they did that their methods, methodology, the history, and their travels, and how they took the gospel from Jerusalem, then to Judea, Samaria, and ultimately, by the time we get to the end of uh, the book of Acts, we see Paul in Rome. We see an outline there at the bottom of page number 87. Uh, This is a short chapter, only 15 verses. There's uh, two major thoughts that we'll look at, the selection of the deacons, Then the opposition that Stephen encountered, one of those deacons, 
And then in chapter 7, we'll see the story that, D, uh, that uh, Stephen tells uh, the Jewish leaders as he is attempting to justify and to witness to them of what he knows to be true about Christ. So we'll also see uh, Philip. Uh, he is mentioned as one of the deacons, and then we'll also see, and uh, very, very shortly, a man named Saul, who we know better as Paul, who may be the greatest Christian uh, that had ever lived. So at the bottom of the page, we begin reading in chapter number 6, verse 1, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So these are, obviously the church is growing, uh, many different uh, kinds of individuals uh, are being added to the church. They're not just Jews, there are many Gentile individuals. These are Greek women who are widows, and it's, it becomes apparent as we go through this chapter that the early church was very concerned in ministering to those in need uh, in, their, in their Christian bodies, in their Christian church. We pick up in verse 2 where it says, Then the twelve uh, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So again, we've said this in the past, the church, Christianity was on a roll. Good things were happening. We know that there was opposition, there was persecution that they had to face, but at the same time, in the face of that persecution, they continued to grow exponentially. So we've divided this uh, first half of the chapter up into three thoughts. The complaint, what was it? The conference, they got together to try to determine how they would solve the problem. And then the choices of the individuals that were presented, the names of those individuals that ultimately became the uh, first deacons and the qualifications. We'll see them on page number 90. So the complaint is simply this that uh, there arose a murmuring. It's apparent from chapters 4 and 5 that the early believers were very conscientious and very generous in ministering to those among them in need. However, there was a perceived disparity and in inequity. Now, whether this was done uh, out of negligence or maybe there was some prejudice uh, uh, that was involved here, the Scriptures uh, do not uh, give us a hint of that. The fact of the matter is that there was a certain group of Greek widows who were not being cared for the way they should have. So, these uh, Grecian Jews likely did not speak Aramaic or Hebrew, and of course when people don't speak the general language of the group of people they're in, it's not unusual for them to, to uh, be left out and to feel left out. Communication is so important. When you can talk with people. If you've ever stood in the presence of a group of people who were speaking a language that you were not familiar with, and you felt left out of the conversation. Some languages, if you've ever heard people speak Vietnamese, Thai, Chinese, Japanese, something like that, it's just like, or how about um, Dutch, or German, or uh, Spanish, or French? Now, I've had a little bit of some of those languages, so I can kind of recognize what language it is, but I'm not fluent in any of them, and I still, left, be, still feel like I'm being left out, as these did. All of this in, this, uh, in these verses, reaffirms the fact that the early church was deeply concerned about having their folks' needs sufficiently met. 
We're looking at the early church. What was important to them should be important to us. In our churches, regardless of their size, whether it's a very, very small group in a fledgling church just getting off the ground, maybe 15, 20 people or thereabouts, or it could be a very large church of hundreds of people or more, the fact of the matter is that we ought to be concerned about those who have needs in our congregations. And, uh, you know, we all, we have this sense about us that we want to build a big church. Well, big churches have big problems. I want you to know that because people bring problems. I remember uh, a, uh, a time uh, some years ago when uh, a couple came forward in a church service before I was uh, the pastor of the church. And I remember the, um, they presented themselves for membership in the church and the pastor introduced them, introduced their names and introduced them this way. He said, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so have come for membership at uh, First Bible Baptist Church. I'd like to introduce to you our two newest problems. <laughs> I don't know how they felt about that. Uh, he said it kind of kiddingly, but there's such a truth uh, rooted deep in that because people have problems. We all have problems. Some people are a very low-maintenance people. They never bring their problems to the pastor or to anybody else. They find someone else or they handle them themselves. And then some people are just, you know, um, they're, uh, they demand a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of problems. Maybe they're more freer about talking about those problems. Some people are very high-maintenance people. Regardless, we need to do the best we can to minister to the genuine and real needs. Notice in that last uh, uh, sentence under letter A, there's absolutely no room for prejudice or favoritism within the body of Christ. Now that's something that's difficult to fight because all of us have a tendency to favor some over others for many, many different reasons. It could be age, it could be gender, it could be race, it could be that they're, uh, they're just kind of like you or uh, they're good looking or maybe they have money or something like that. And there's a tendency for all of us to be prejudicial. Well, the conference is held, bottom of page 88, the 12 apostles are greatly concerned about the problem and rightly they should be. They call the people together and reason that providing food and other forms of care are not what Jesus called them specifically to do. That doesn't mean that they're not involved or contributors, but it wasn't their job uh, to run a feeding station. What was more important for them as the church grew is that they continue to minister the Word of God, that they stay in prayer, and that they teach and lead other people to do the same thing. So they're looking for people to come alongside them to help them. We have to be careful to avoid interpreting the apostles' response as being selfish, lazy, or arrogant. Success brought growth, growth brought new situations and concerns and greater needs. So more people had to shoulder the uh, problems of this church. The disciples are looking for help. The bar is set very high, though. They just don't want anybody being a leader or a servant in the ministry. And we ought to be the same, obviously, today. We need to qualify those who are leaders. Leaders should be chosen, and uh, they should be pre-qualified to make sure they're the type of people that we want leading and actually even serving in our churches because they say something about the rest of us. They say something about the church, your church, the church I'm a member of, and they do say something about Christ and who he is. The disciples are looking for, verse 3 says, seven men who are among them. They're familiar with them. They have a good reputation. They're full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They're Christians, apparently. They're full of faith, and they will serve tables and meet the needs of the widows as servants. Verse 4 reaffirms the primary responsibility and calling of the disciples to prayer and the ministry of the Word no apologies for that. This is important. Pastors, uh, having been one and still as an associate pastor, pastors uh, are 
generally are servant type personalities. They like to get things done, and particularly males. Males draw a great deal of satisfaction from uh, starting and finishing a job and standing back and saying, there, that's done. So it's a great temptation for pastors, for church leaders to get involved in everything in the church and try to do everything in the church. And um, that's a wonderful characteristic, a wonderful um, personality trait. But the problem is that the pastor's responsibility is to be a spiritual leader in the church. And the spiritual leaders in the church need to be spiritual. So they need to spend time in Scripture, in the Word of God, in prayer. That's very, very important. And people in the church should ensure the congregation and then the deacon, the elder level of leaders in the church, should ensure that the pastor teachers have the proper amount of time to study, to prepare, to feed the sheep. It's vitally important, the choices. It's important, letter C on page 89, it's important to note that it was of great importance to the multitude of disciples that this was a spiritual, Holy Ghost guided and directed process. However, your church chooses its leaders needs to be a spiritual, Holy Ghost directed process. You need to give God the opportunity to be involved in what's going on in determining leadership, whether it's choosing a new pastor, whether it's choosing an associate or a deacons or elders or Sunday school superintendents or teachers. Those choices need to be spirit-guided. We need to be careful that we just don't plug people in because we have a need. Sometimes the wrong person in a good place can create more problems than they solve. You'll just need another person to come in and correct everything that that person has uh, done improperly or wrong. Two of the seven men are well known, page number 90 at the top, Stephen and Philip. Both of them show up just uh, shortly after they are mentioned here in, in uh, chapter number six. But let's move down to, uh, let's move down to the qualifications for a deacon from First Timothy chapter three in the middle of page 90. They need to be, now I've taken the Bible word, but I've given a, in many cases a brief definition an equivalent or a synonym of those. They need to be honorable and honest people, not double-tongued. That is, they say what they mean and they mean what they say. They're not hypocritical with their mouths. They don't say one thing and do another. They're uh, not given too much wine. Uh, there's lots of controversy over the issue of alcohol and whatnot, and c certainly this verse lends itself to that. Uh, they're not greedy. They hold the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. That they ought to know the mystery of the faith. That's why they spend time in the Word of God and in prayer. They need to be proven, not novices. They need to be unaccused. Um, uh, they need to have good reputations, again, blameless. You need to look at the leader, the deacon or the pastor or the elder's wife. What kind of person is the wife of this individual? That is in, uh, incredibly important also. Well, the list is, uh, you can read down through there, and, and uh, you can maybe talk about that at the break when we're done with this session. All right, notice on uh, the opposition encountered by Stephen. Let's read verses 8 and following to the end of the chapter. And Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They weren't happy with Stephen's ministry or preaching, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He's telling the truth, and they didn't have anything to come back at him with. They could only respond with accusations, slurs, uh, slander, 
name calling, etc. We see that a lot today in our culture, do we not? It says they weren't able to resist. Verse 11, then they suborned, they uh, bribed, they purchased some witnesses which said, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. The libertines were very liberal in liberal, free in their interpretation of truth and law. They were um, uh, liberals. They were uh, religious liberals. That's how we would categorize them today. And they didn't like the conservative orthodox teaching and preaching of Stephen. So what they did in verse 13, it says they set up false witnesses, which said this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him. It's quite a statement here at the end of chapter 15. I'm not exactly sure what this means. I got maybe a picture in my mind, but they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Well, we learn this from these verses, that Stephen um, did great wonders and miracles. So the apostles were not the only ones in the early church that had these gifts or these abilities to do that. But he was a faithful uh, individual. He was a skilled witness. We know that from reading the next chapter. And um, he was given, um, as a result of his ministry, his personality, his qualifications, he also had the uh, uh, privilege of doing great wonders and miracles. Secondly, we see B, letter B on 91, the malice of some. The faithful declaration of the Word of God is sure to bring anger and opposition. We know that. Jerusalem contained a diverse conglomeration of Jews. The text tells us that there was a certain synagogue. This was a liberal synagogue of the Libertines. The term means freed men. The term is used today with reference to people who are morally unrestrained or amoral, I might say. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says that these are liberated slaves or their descendants. Well, that's another thought on who they were, and that's possible, but they were very liberal in their approach to Old Testament truth. There are several interpretations of the term, but it's clear from the text that they are from a variety of different places, and they're listed in your notes and Bible. They take exception to the message and the preaching of Stephen, and um, they attack. The only thing they could do, though, was conspire against him and falsely accuse him of blasphemy. It says they suborned men. They colluded or conspired against him, and they hired false witnesses, which still is a pretty common technique today. If you want to destroy somebody's reputation, hire somebody to say something bad about you in a court of law. Stephen is now examined by the Sanhedrin personally. We've already seen the Jewish leaders and elders get involved back in chapters 4 and 5, and now uh, Stephen is being called to task here um, in chapter number 7 as he stands before them and gives them a history of the children of Israel. The uh, statement that they saw him as, a, as an angel, uh, my comment here at the bottom of page 91 is that he remained calm, he remained composed, in his, um, he just had a confident look on his face and not an arrogant look on his face. Again, as I said earlier, I'm not exactly sure what the face of an angel looks like. Stephen's reaction is reminiscent of Christ before his accusers. We see in, uh, at the bottom, or in the middle, I should say, of page 92, several applications that we can draw from this text. The chapter teaches us that the community of believers used its own people to solve its own problems. 
That's good. The church used a spirit-guided process, spirit-guided to bring about a spirit-guided solution. Local churches ought to be able to solve their own problems from within with uh, the uh, filling of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God, knowing the Scriptures, dealing with people equitably, fairly, uh, charitably. We ought to be able to resolve our own problems from within. And by the time we've investigated and we come to uh, decisions or conclusions, they ought to be almost, if not unanimous, that this is what we should do in this situation. Again, there's no room for prejudice or neglect within the church. Three things ring clear from the text. It's the responsibility of pastors and elders to minister the Word of God and pray. This is the number one priority for the pastor, for the leadership, the teaching leadership of the church. It ensures their spirituality and their knowledge of God's Word grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the responsibility of the body, top of 93, to see that the personal needs of every, the needs, not the wants, but the needs of our members are addressed and met. And as the body grows, methods must be employed to ensure that both functions of the church are carried out. So here are some thoughts here. Chapter 6 is a short is a brief chapter, but uh, let's move on to chapter number seven. Let's get started there before we take a break. We've got about five minutes or so before we do that. We're in chapter number seven. Now, chapter seven is a history. It's a history of of the Jews, of Israel, and Stephen is basically, he's a witness. This is what he knows about the history of his country and his his nation, his religious uh, uh, affiliation, And what he's doing now is he's kind of connecting the dots. He's going all the way back, essentially, to the beginning, and then he's connecting the dots, showing how Christ really is the fulfillment of all that these Old Testament people were speaking about, what they were expecting, and that Christ has actually come now, and he is the fulfillment of all of that. So let's look at the introduction here at the top of page number 95. Um, let's see, uh, there's just a reference here. The first paragraph talks about what was said in the last chapter. And the uh, second paragraph says, Stephen was a witness. Like each and every one of the believers were called to be, his witness was contested by certain Jews of the synagogue of the Libertines. And, of course, he was accused of blasphemy. Chapter 7 then continues Stephen's response to them. And here's the outline. The charges are brought against Stephen. That's, uh, go, we can go back to the end of chapter number 6 into chapter 7, verse 1. Stephen then responds with uh, a sevenfold history of the nation of Israel. The Sanhedrin is not happy, obviously, in verses 54. Stephen has a vision of Christ, very interesting situation just prior to, uh, their, to his stoning when uh, the uh, religious leaders execute a, a Stephen because of what he has said in the application of his texts. So we wrapped up in uh, <clears throat> at the bottom of page 95, we wrapped up Uh, verses uh, 11 through 15 in chapter number 6. This is the accusation. Let's pick up in chapter 7, verse number 2. We'll read a little bit of this, and we'll see what Stephen has to say. Here's the history of the nation of Israel according to Stephen. He said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, listen, listen, hear. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dealt in Charon and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show you. This takes us all the way back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter number 12. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon, 
And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. This is Genesis chapter 15. This is a, a prophecy of the Israelite captivity in Egypt. Verse 7, And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place, in this land of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, that's Genesis chapter 17. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. The twelve patriarchs, that is, the twelve, the individuals, the fathers, a patriarch is a father, the fathers of the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. So there's some thoughts that we could pick up on that. Abraham did not immediately obey, verse 4. He did not leave his kindred. Abraham is an example of one who grows in faith. His faith was relatively weak when he first met the Lord and his response was somewhat slow. God appeared to Abraham, guided him, blessed him, before there was a temple, and Abraham did not need a temple to be close to God. Just kind of um, interesting, the approach. He's saying to the children of Israel, to these sp spiritual leaders that are confronting him, he's saying, he's saying you know, the temple, as, um, as important as it is to us, isn't all that important. You can worship God without a building, Worship is more than going to a building, showing up at a specific time or place for a specific ceremony, and then saying that you have worshiped. Worship is more than that. So why don't we just stop right here. Let's take a break here. At, um, at the end of verse number 8, we're going to come back, and we're going to read uh, and pick up at verse number 9, and we'll get through chapter number 7. Let's take a break.